Okay, I th think we'll get started. So, hey, welcome everybody. Um, it's really great to see some new faces for me, actually. So I um, look forward to getting to know some folks in the second half once we've had a chance to um, hear a bit from uh, directly from faculty. Um, for those who uh, haven't, I haven't had a chance to meet. I'm Brian Norman. Um, uh, I use he, him, or inclusive they pronouns, and I. Um, as of last August, I'm the Vice President for Academic Affairs here at Antioch College. Um, and I'm excited to um, be the, the person who gets to moderate the fourth in a five-part um, series of panels um, featuring the work of our faculty um, and organized around um, some interdisciplinary strengths that are uh, that bring us together across talents and disciplines and interests and in teaching and scholarly and, and creative agendas. Um, and the goal of these panels is to um, uh, marshal uh, all of the uh, generations of Antioch alums and give them a chance to um, connect with the current generation of faculty who are helping to create the next generation of Antiochians, uh, which we think, you know, builds on, um, you know, such a powerful legacy in history and is also doing some thoughtful adaptations um, for the needs of the day and the interests of the, our students and, and the um, higher ed of the future. So that's what we're doing here. Um, I joined um, Antioch on uh, about six months and three weeks ago. Um, uh, and I um, inspired by the mission and history of Antioch, and I know all of you are as well, um, and also uh, feel my own sense of um, uh, purpose in doing what I can to make sure that the world continues to um, benefit from the presence of a special place like Antioch. And, the, and as everyone knows, this is a very consequential moment throughout all of higher ed, but for Antioch in particular, as we're um, finding our way to um, stability and strength and a clear headed um, sense of who we are and um, and where we fit in, in the higher ed landscape. So um, what that has meant on our end is faculty and the rest of the Antioch community have been uh, working really hard on um, identifying for ourselves uh, an academic vision that we're proud of that's focused on interdisciplinary strengths, meaningful work, both in co-op, of course, but also more broadly as we integrate world and workplace experience in the academic um, program, and also really thinking clearly and, and, and joyfully about Antioch as a small place of abundance and action. Um, and one of those uh, five interdisciplinary strengths that we're identifying and building out um, is the newly named, thanks to the faculty, especially Forrest, who you'll meet in a second, uh, focus on cultural production and creative practice. And we'll talk more about what that means. It's very broadly conceived. And it's just one example of what we are or can be known for at Antioch. And it brings together faculty and courses across areas, across disciplines. And we're conscious of the way that we're building on um, a long history of a college that has always changed lives and creates graduates who then go on to change the world and um, uh, and in their change the world, change their communities, change their professions, change the broader um, culture. And in this particular focus, we're conscious of the way that we're building on Antioch's tradition of, of students who don't just study ideas in the classroom, but go out into the world and do things and make things. And in this case, I mean make quite literally. Um, they create new culture through objects, words, images, experiences, archives. You know, I'm thinking, and hopefully you are, of, of uh, the late Julia Reichert and John Sims, for instance. I'm thinking of uh, the Art Annex and the Antioch Review and the Foundry. And I'm also thinking of ways that our current students are carrying on that tradition, such as a really fantastic documentary that a few of our uh, students put together called Pansy that is documenting the, the queer uh, underground culture that is blooming at Antioch right now. Um, 
And I'm also really proud that we're making creative practice, uh, which has always been a hallmark of, of what's possible at American liberal education. We're making it accessible to a remarkably diverse student population who is going to go on to create the culture of the future. And this is actually a, a, a really success spot of Antioch today, while we are a small place of abundance, our remarkably diverse student body includes at least a quarter of students who are the first in their generation to go to college. And that's probably underrepresented. That's a hard one to measure. Um, almost half of our students identify as students of color. About three quarters of our students um, are eligible for the federal Pell Grant, which means that their expected family contribution is, is at or near zero. So this is really a transformative opportunity, not just for them, but for their families. And about the same amount of our students also identify as LGBTQ+, very broadly conceived. Um, so this is a, a place of remarkable diversity and inclusion, and we're really proud of that. So today we're going to um, spend about the first half of the panel chatting uh, and, and hearing from the faculty themselves with some, some general prompts that I put together. And then we want to open out to the um, everyone here on the call for uh, uh, ideas and questions and, and um, stories from you. So I'll start with having faculty introduce themselves. And we have three faculty now and, and one more of our colleagues might join us uh, soon. Um, and I'll ask them to introduce themselves with their name, their pronouns, their role at Antioch, and maybe a sentence or two to get us started on what cultural production and creative practice means to them at Antioch. And I'll start with Forrest because he helped us land on those words. Um, Forrest. Hi. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Forrest Bright. Um, my pronouns are he and they them. Um, yeah, I've been at Antioch um, since 2015. So I've seen a lot of change in the past, you know, what, it's eight years now, uh, getting close to eight years. Um, <clears throat> I, um, you know, to me, I'm really trying to give students uh, a grounding. I, I teach mostly um, um, things related to like kind of two dimensions, drawing, painting, printmaking. I teach design. Um, and uh, I also teach a lot of uh, interdisciplinary classes, so things oriented around collaboration, um, uh, other kinds of like social practice or contemporary um, collaboration. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of oriented towards really trying to encourage students to make significant work now. You know, it's not something that we're just sort of practicing and then like later on you're going to do this it's like in the classroom we're trying to make real work like from from year one um so like i i you know in recognizing where people are at and i'm 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 not um kind of unaware students might be just starting out but um but i think it's like kind of trying to understand who they are and given our size, that's actually sort of possible for us um, in ways that I haven't experienced in other teaching jobs. Um, and so it's, it's, um, I, and you'll, you'll kind of see this in some of the stories I might share, you know, students made work here that has gone on to film festivals that has gone on um, to be in the world of culture now. Um, anyway, thank you. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Forrest. Um, Louisa. Thanks, Brian. Um, it's good to be here tonight with all of you. My name is Louisa Beery. I use she, her, her pronouns. Um, I am an associate professor of cooperative education, community arts and performance. So the main hat that I wear at Antioch is in the co-op department, um, but I also teach um, performance. And um, like Forrest have been at Antioch since 2015. Um, I guess what I would say about cultural production at Antioch is um, it's it's exciting to see our students make their own original work. I would um, underscore what Forrest um, has said. They're making their work now and it reflects our students really finding their unique voices and their authentic voices. Um, I think students' cultural production at Antioch is authentic. I think it's experimental. Um, I think that it's revelatory in their ability to share their in storytelling and in imagery. 
Um, and I think many of you would find some of those same characteristics that they kind of weave through the generations of Antiochians who are culture producers and makers and artists. Thanks, Louisa. And we also have uh, Michael. Hi, I'm uh, Mike Caselli, actually alum of the college from 1987. Uh, I graduated with a self-design major myself in visual arts and performance theory. Um, have been back in Antioch since, since the closure. Uh, moved back from Brooklyn to work to try to uh, reopen the college. Uh, I am the currently the chair of the arts division. Uh, professor of Sculpture and Installation and uh, Creative Director of the Herndon Gallery. Yeah, the cultural, the idea of cultural production, I think, is 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 key uh, to what our students can do and will do. Uh, understanding that things they make, things they put out, um, have an effect of reflecting their culture and uh, affecting their culture, and I think that's really important to understand the kind of breadth of that. And I like to start students out with not so much of a heavy, oh, you have to make art right now. Let's try things. I'm a very much a DIYer, a tinkerer. And I try to get my students engaged in that, di that idea of tinkering, no matter what form that might take. Uh, I do, um, I teach a class called Stuff, because I thought, what better thing to call a intro level to making than stuff? What do we do? We make stuff. Let's take it from there. I also teach, I have taught performance, uh, and I started out, out actually as a media arts professor uh, when I first started teaching before I became uh, the sculpture and installation uh, professor at the college. Uh, so, yeah, it's really exciting for me to to watch students find their voice. I think that's a really important thing. And also understand that the first thing they do, it maybe isn't gonna work, but the work is what is important, right? You keep working at it. You keep trying things and it may not work, you know, right away, but eventually if you keep doing that, it's gonna teach you things and move you forward and allow you to kind of have your the voice that you wanna have. The other thing I talk to my students about, we're all, we all have our own creative language. So with the idea of critique, it's like, how do we help each other refine our creative language, it, making us able to speak to each other? So that's, that's really uh, some of the things I'm very, very interested in. Thanks, Michael. Um, and Brooke Blackman Bryan uh, was going to join us, but she's dealing with the family emergency right now. Um, she's uh, currently the Dean of Cooperative International Community-Based Learning and also um, an Associate Professor of, of Writing. And um, one of the things that she'll be doing is helping us bring back the annual oral history um, in the Liberal Arts Summer Institute. Um, and so if she were here, I imagine she would talk about the importance of story and preserving stories and helping folks tell their stories and make meaning of their lives through story as itself a part of cultural production and the archive is a part of cultural production and we're trying to think very expansively and inclusively about these different forms of making and these different ways as Forrest is saying of making now and engaging our, our actual communities with with our products. Um, so with that, let's uh, let me start with a, a question that gets you know right to the heart of you know why we're here and why we exist, which is students and teaching. Um, and there's you know just a ton of uh, classes that happen at Antioch, and and so much of what it means to be a dynamic and, ex and experimental um, college is the kind of pedagogy is is engaged and active and project based, and, and students roll up their sleeves and do things. And so the act of making is is shows up in all sorts of wonderful places across our curriculum, obviously in studio-based courses, but also elsewhere. Um, so I'd love to hear from some of the faculty panelists, what's your favorite course that involves cultural production and creative practice and why? Um, why don't you start us off, Louisa? Sure. Um, I think definitely my favorite course so far, I've been teaching for a few years now in the performance area is called Writing and Performing the Self. Um, and so it's an autobiographical 
um, storytelling and playwriting class in which all the students, um, they each develop about a 15 minute solo performance. Um, the, the term culminates in their performing of their original work um, based on experiences from their own lives. Um, and oftentimes in the class students have, I've encouraged students to think about site specific performance, um, incorporating, you know, projecting images, um, sound, really fully also embodying their storytelling practice. Um, and I, you know, I, I challenge every student to kind of step out of their comfort zone and um, find a balance around um, vulnerability and authenticity in their writing. Um, um, but also, you know, stories that every time I teach the class, I feel like I learn from the students so much about kind of their their courage and their willingness to kind of bring their full selves out. And um, and I'm always amazed how creative they can be really thinking outside of the box. Um, uh, every time I feel like my expectations are just kind of blown away by what they, they end up really um, fully presenting and performing. Um, and it's, it's always feels like the class is a real journey from the very beginnings of just these seeds of stories to really fully embodying them. Um, I also taught an independent study last term um, that was storytelling through the black lens. That was wonderful. Um, and uh, storytelling is an intro performance class that I also teach, but I think definitely writing and performing the self is the one that I've um, enjoyed the most recently. Hmm. What about you, Forrest? If you're talking, I think you might be on mute. Sorry, I, I was actually getting a slide together just so I could show you. Um, I, I My favorite class that I teach is actually my intro class. It's called Arts 111. Um, and it's, it's really like um, two-dimensional design, but I kind of focus it around images and kind of thinking about images more broadly. Um, it's sort of like a, a, I would say in some ways, it's a little bit like an art appreciation class. Um, if, if you're way old school, um, you know, it's introducing them to a lot of themes in art, a lot of, a lot of kind of construction ideas of how it, to make images or how, um, you know, we, we kind of draw a lot. Um, but <clears throat> um, that class, uh, it's really a fundamental, um, sort of class, but I try, part of it is I'm trying to hook students to like get them in it. Um, I'm teaching that one right now. Um, today, this week, we're working on pattern. So we're, we're kind of thinking about um, these gestalt sort of principles and design um, ideas of like closure um, where you don't need, you just need just enough information for a viewer to like fill in what's there. Um, or another example might be um, proximity. So there, you know, uh, uh, if we see objects that are close together, we tend to make them form a group. Um, there are the kind of these foundational things about um, sort of design using pattern. Um, but then we get the same sort of lesson. We get into um, the mosques throughout um, the Middle East and sort of the design patterns in those. Um, we look at how actually like a lot of those designs, you know, these kind of um, uh, like crenellated ceilings and the domes. Um, there are these elaborate patterns, geometric patterns, you know, they are kind of simultaneously like a, a kind of, um, a, you know, architecture, but they're also a, 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 they have a sound function that actually, they actually um, limit um, the amount of echo in a space. So like a prayer would be more clear. You know, part of part of what I'm trying to do always is kind of ground what we're talking about in history of art and also in kind of giving it context always. So, um, you know, as we're making images, we are part of a context, whether we recognize it or not. And my goal is for students to recognize it, you know, to sort of understand where they are in this chain of image makers throughout time, you know, and and and, you know, that's an ongoing thing to sort of research that and understand where you're at and where you're coming from. So that's that's like the start. And then we kind of end with the capstone. And I just wanted to um, show you some images for that real quick. Um, 
Let me see if I can make this work. Um, can y'all see okay? I'm gonna, I'm gonna make it larger. Um, this was a student, Judith Rose, who did their capstone a, a few years ago. It was um, right when COVID hit, so we had to like move everything online. It was kind of a disaster. But, um, but Judith's work is not, uh, it's kind of exquisite. Um, making these kind of illustrations that are about intimacy and nature. Um, let me show you. And, and you can find these like on the colloquial websites. Um, this is, uh, sorry, this is a stray slide. It's about natural dying. That's for a different story. Um, but um, I just wanted to show you a couple other students that are making senior projects right now. Um, Shelley Warnock Gordon is uh, making a series of illustrations uh, based on um, uh, uh, the, the kind of environment of Ohio. And so they're all sort of centered around um, uh, animals that, that Ohio is sort of this, the, where they kind of originate. Um, and then um, uh, Michael uh, Perea is actually making a short film. Uh, there's not images to show you yet. Uh, they're kind of making this sort of um, horror uh, social commentary sort of film. I'm, I'm not totally sure what it is yet. It's still in the works, but, um, but I wanted to show you one of their illustrations that they did a few years ago, uh, just to kind of show you the work some students are making now. Um, so right now I'm teaching first years and I'm teaching fourth years. Um, so it's kind of an exciting time. Anyway, um, let me, let me turn it back over. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Forrest. That's just gorgeous imagery. Um, and you mentioned uh, getting folks to um, understand the, the location where art happens or where making happens. And um, as everyone on this call knows, the, uh, the campus itself of Antioch and its location in Yellow Springs is quite special and, and allows for certain kinds of um, making to happen in the Herndon Gallery and the Foundry Theater on the campus itself uh, as a place to invite community in or the little theater downtown. Uh, and I know uh, all the faculty on this call and others really engage the campus in, in cultural production. So I'd love to hear from some examples from some of the faculty of how they've used some of those, what we're now learning to call learning hubs, sites where learning is happening. Um, uh, Caselli, uh, do you wanna share how you've used some of the, one or some of those hubs? Uh, yeah, I mean, as creative director of the gallery, uh, I've been engaged with uh, uh, producing exhibitions that have a connection to more than the the campus, but also to issues that are uh, part of our mission. So in the past year, I've done two exhibits of uh, returned artists or formerly incarcerated artists as part of uh, uh, two organizations, one RAG, uh, and we did their first exhibition uh, recently. Uh, let's see, RAG, I'm trying to remember. Uh, Returned Artist Guild? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm mixing it with, and that was a show of uh, a bunch of work, which actually is really interesting because right now uh, the Mellon Foundation is uh, put, for, put forward an initiative of uh, $125 million uh, to support programs that exhibit this kind of work. And some of the people that we've had in our, in the exhibitions are included uh, in those descriptions. So that's very exciting. And it activates the gallery. Uh, the second one was uh, Ohio Prisons Action Network. Uh, it was part of a uh, four different sites around Ohio showing cell screens done by uh, uh, recently returned or uh, incarcerated artists. Uh, and we put it together with a program that I was calling Herndon Speaks, where we also had a panel to talk about what the work was. Um, so we had the exhibit. It was kind of a pop-up exhibit, uh, working with Kathy Roma, who's very active in the, in, in the prisons with uh, music and uh, performance. Uh, and so that was great. That was we had, you know, a great uh, gathering of people in the gallery. So kind of opening up the gallery as a space, we just did a, a piece as a tribute to John Sims, who was an Antioch alum, who was a, 
a math student, but also uh, had done so many other things, mixing mathematics and the arts. Um, we did a birthday celebration, and that was happening simultaneously at two other sites in the U.S. at Ringling Brothers and at his gallery in Detroit. Uh, and we had we had talked about I had gone to his memorial in Detroit and talked with the uh, the woman who ran the gallery, Misha, and we came up with this idea of kind of echoing his work. He's done a lot of he did a lot of projects that were happened simultaneously. Uh, critique of the Confederate flag uh, and different things. And so we thought this was a great way to kind of celebrate his work um, and reinvest in this idea uh, that he had around love and the relationship of mathematics to love. So um, that's been some of my work in, in that way. And, you know, also trying to get spaces activated and students involved, uh, letting students take on leadership positions in organization um, around creative spaces on campus. Yeah, I, and I love that that the creativity blooming in unexpected places. Um, love to hear a little bit more about some of the other corners of campus. I know Louisa, you've engaged the Foundry, for instance, a bit, um, and then Forrest has really turned the whole campus into a community art installation this year in some interesting ways. Um, so I'd love to hear a touch on, on both of those. Louisa, how about you? Sure. Um, I was uh, calculating today. So I think my first performance was in the foundry in 1993. Um, I, some of you may recognize my um, grandparents are alumni of Antioch. And so I actually grew up in Yellow Springs and I um, started taking classes uh, with Louise Smith and others back in that era. Um, I think at one point I performed under the Otra Banda tent out on the um, golf course and uh, a lot of fond memories of um, Meredith Dallas and other, you know, greats in the um, in the foundry in those days um, and before my time. Um, but so it's been a long time, and I just it's a it's a space that I love. I, I tell students I consider it a, a sacred place in terms of the amount of story and collaboration and deep involvement that's been there. I think I'm, I'm really glad that the World House Choir right now calls the Foundry their home. And uh, I know Michael has been instrumental in helping bring some other um, community um, engaged partners into the Foundry. So we've been able to re-engage with the Yellow Springs High School and um, Mad River Theater Company. Um, it's so it's it's always a joy to see that space activated. Um, I think it's the largest, Michael, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I think it's the largest black box theater in Green County and in sort of our area. It's uh, around here. To the, uh, the kitchen in New York, the performance space. Uh, it's, it's the same, pretty much the same layout. And it's so, it's so versatile. It's, um, it's amazing to me, like the amount of works that I've seen there over the years from the community dance concerts of, you know, Yellow Springs collaboration to students work and they just, the space is continually transformed. Um, and I think that's one of, one of the reasons why it's so exciting to work in that space as an artist is because it's, it's kind of a raw space that you can um, make your own. Um, but yeah, it's it's and it's uh it's still is sort of on a corner of campus. But I think um, as we kind of engage some activities, and maybe Forrest can talk a little bit more about um, some events that have happened in the old art building. And Michael's had some stuff happening in the sculpture annex. And I think I think within the arts, we probably activate more spaces on <laughs> campus than most. <laughs> and and you'll always find installations like popping up everywhere. Um, I sometimes I'm just walking through campus. I'm like, oh. Sometimes it's startling. Um, yeah, there you go. <laughs> Forrest, what do you want to add? <laughs> yeah, I'd especially Forrest, wanna, would love to hear a bit about how you've turned the campus into a a place that invites the community in and it's almost like a pop-up installation itself. Yeah, so um, uh, it's kind of like a long thing running. Um, there was a, a kind of um, community college sort of um, um, conference that basically start, it was, it's been put on by the GLCA and it, it kept getting delayed because of COVID because nobody could meet in person. Um, it was a, it was a set of roundtables where we would meet with um, uh, people in the community and people from the college get kind of stakeholders to like have these larger conversations about how how do these things work together and we ended up getting a, a 
a small grant from the GLCA to, to do a series of um, these performances. We ended up calling them open. Um, it, was, it was kind of uh, written and figured out by a, a group of collaborators, um, a guy here in town named Justin Herman, who's a designer who lives um, on, the, on the golf course, the field um, um, near Antioch. Um, uh, uh, Misty, another, another local musician um, who, who helped us um, kind of recruit musicians to come to these events. Um, anyway, they, they're, they're a series of open mic events that students could participate in, but also community leaders. Um, and we ended up using the, um, the amphitheater, the outdoor amphitheater, which a student had painted a mural um, in the space. It was actually a community project to um, another project um, that Comsol kind of uh, fostered. Um, but then what we did was we used a projection mapping software to actually project animations on the, on the student's mural, kind of uh, creating sort of movement and patterns, and then musicians played in front of that. I'm going to show a short video if that's okay, if we have time. Sure. Okay. I mean, yeah, then we'll then we'll open out to the to the rest of the panel. Sure. Um, here we go. Um, it kind of involves hip hop. There's gonna be some music here. Just prepare yourself if your speakers go off. Uh, here we go. On, on. Oh, that was not working. Anyway, um, so so that was one of the events. We actually had, um, I think it ended up being like six or seven events throughout the fall. Every few weeks we would have one, often outdoors. We partnered with a, a local business in town, Rosenthal's. Um, we had one there that was pretty successful with some great food. Um, but it was, it was, uh, this interesting dynamic where, you know, I got to meet a lot of people in town who I didn't know were cultural producers, you know, um, I had seen them maybe a lot, but this was a, a place where they could kind of share what they make, um, and see what, what, uh, people in our community, like directly with the college are making. Um, anyway, we're going to do more of this. Uh, uh, it's kind of an ongoing thing, but we're kind of waiting for the weather to turn and for people to, which it kind of happened today, but for people to maybe start going outside again, you know. Yeah, and there's such uh, wonderful instances of community too, and and helping reflect back um, that the that the stuff that individuals are doing is culture itself, and that they are cultural producers is I think an important framing too. Um, I want to make sure that we have time to um, invite. Uh, 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 contributions from the alumni who are with us today. So if I had had more time, I was going to ask the, the panelists to tell, share us a bit about their own work um, and what they're up to these days and, and maybe um, how being at Antioch in a magical place like Antioch has shaped the kind of art and culture that they produce. Um, so maybe you all can slip that in in the ensuing conversation. Um, but I, I want, uh, I think Tristan is going to um, unmute people's mics and happy to um, uh, open up to folks' questions, observations, memories, 
of uh, what we are doing and trying to activate the campus and our curriculum by putting cultural production and creative practice at one center of it. Well, I'll, I'll step in. Go for it. <laughs> uh, Catherine Jordan, she, her, hers, a graduate of 72. I was a non-dancer dancer. So I was very uh, honored to be, I, I performed quite a bit in uh, the late 60s and 70s with people like Michael Fagans and Diana Breakstone or Diane Breakstone and Brooke Higdon and a number of people that were quite, proficient or quite exciting choreographers and they invited us you know they needed people besides the trained dancers to to dance so it was uh an extraordinary part of my uh education because it, it wasn't my focus but i learned so much and um just last year was our, our my 50th reunion and i was able to invite a lot of the choreographer dancers back to town and we reprised a number of things like trio a which was a Yvonne Rayner uh pedestrian dance we we did that on um, in the foundry theater and we did pop-up dances and um so it was uh felt like a good 50 year kind of um reconnection um I do have a question about uh, cultural appropriation. Mm -hmm. uh, good, and, that's a good uh, start. Yeah. Uh, so art, you know, music, art, people borrow, you know, nothing sort of new. It's all been uh, recaptured and rehashed and redone. I mean, I think about hip hop and sampling. And so we ran into a little bit of a buzzsaw on campus last year because of some person's uh, assumption that there was some cultural appro appropriation. And uh, it was a very uh, unpleasant experience. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I think there's a issue, you know, I, I worry about, you know, wokeness. You know, there's a place for being woke, but there's a place for um, experimentation and being open to um, all ideas. So I, I guess I have a question back to the faculty about how do you balance that and how do you, um, you know, is there, you know, is there a hard line here on cultural appropriation um, or, you know, how does that sort of settle out? Thanks. What a good question. Go for it, Michael. Yeah, I mean, I can, speak, I can speak a little, uh, a little bit to that because I also teach at art modernist art history class. Um, and what is exciting for me with that class is that while we still look at the kind of traditional canon of modernism, 1864, 1970, you know, those are fungible edges. Um, what I do with that class is also allow the students to present research and present work that has been excluded. Uh, because of the canon, which has been a white male Western European and canon for so long, and to look into each part and find our other artists who have been excluded from the conversation and bring them back into the conversation. And also to look at, um, you know, things like Picasso and the use of primitive kind of iconography and what does that mean? And how do you start to talk about that stuff? And also, how do you start to talk about work that the artist may exhibit things that you totally disagree with? Can we still look at the art? Where is it? Where are those boundaries, right? And where is appropriation? Where is appropriation found in that? Um, so it, it it for me like that that art history class for me is incredibly exciting because. The students basically run the class. They do the presentations, and then we have a discussion about it, right? And we look at how it intersects with the traditional canon, but also how it exists 
and should be in, included within that canon. So that's one thing I, I you know, excites me to deal with uh, those conversations because it's been really, really fruitful. I, the last one I had was incredible. They did incredible work. Forest, and then I think Truth is in the stack after that. Yeah, um, you know, I think um, if this is true said in here, it is an important conversation. I think it's one we're having in classes a lot. Um, and I and I think, you know, how I like to frame it is um, I want students to be as culturally aware as possible. So, you know, it's like we have these different narratives going on of art history, of what's happened in the past. And I think one of the things we're running into in the world is that there have been sort of dominant narratives and there's actually a lot of narratives and they're all really rich and rewarding and interesting to engage in and see how things overlap. Um, you know, I often think that um, the, these, these places of kind of contention where you know, we're kind of like struggling culturally, like what is happening right now. These are the places I want our students to be. These are the, the conversations I want our students in and that I want them engaged in, because that's, they're actually going to untie these knots. You know, they're going to figure out how, how to make work for themselves that, that still resonates and still has meaning. And it doesn't feel like it's, you know, uh, infringing on someone else or stealing their property or you know it, it, these are these are complicated conversations one thing i'll say just my personal belief which i a friend posted today at their own kind of saying but um why art can never truly be owned or controlled by anyone um it is like water it is like air it exists in movement it exists in temporary autonomous zones it happens in improvisation it happens in felt experience. It lives within the cracks and shadows. Its surfaces mutate and change to avoid classification. Uh, to define or to classify it or commodify it loses its magic immediately. And thus the subversive will always arise. Like a cockroach or vermin, it will survive long after human ruin. Um, anyway, just a thought. Thanks. And I also love, Forrest, how you've um, curated legitimately multiracial happenings where identity is present, but also cross identitarian inter interaction happens. But I think Truth wanted to weigh in on this too. Yeah, um, I, it's cool to follow for us because Kathy also said the word hip hop, so I had to come in. Um, Cause yes, hip hop is based off of sampling. We sample people that we love, James Brown. We owe James Brown so much money for that, all of that soul that we stole, right? You know, so the thing is, people that point the finger and talking about cultural appropriation, it's one thing to have the conversation, but people that point the finger need to really look at themselves because nothing is original in, in, to a degree, but there is a such thing as cultural appropriation, right? And what I like is in classes like Caselli's class, you know, um, we've talked about these things as they come up, you know, and we've explored things deeper. But one class I was in, I can't remember whose class it was in, but it was an art class. And um, they talked about this lady who was a famous artist and she did this rendition of um, Emmett Till. She was a white lady. Um, she might've been a Jewish lady, I don't remember, but she did this rendition of Emmett Till and it was posted in this space. And even the concept of where it was posted was an issue. Cause they were like, oh my God, cause is she taking up a space that could have been held by someone of a person of color? Does she have a right to take this image that is so meaningful for us? Cause it was him in the casket and it was abstract. She did her thing with it, right? Does she have a right to play with this image? You know, and so that was the whole thing. But what I liked was it started the conversation about Emmett Till. So now we can talk about Emmett Till. You know what I'm saying? Now we can, we, if you want to talk about the culture that's being stole. Let's talk about the culture that's being stolen. You feel what I'm saying? So I'm not saying that um, every, cause like, you know, I got into a lot of debates on campus myself about um, uh, should white people be allowed to wear dreadlocks? And I'm like, myself, I know the history of hair. I know the history of dreadlocks. You know what I'm saying? Um, that's, it's not a black thing. Okay. But that one, one place where it was a, it was a beef on campus one time because uh, uh, a student was wearing he a head wrap. 
And uh, the incident got out of hand. It should have been a, we should have been able to come and have a conversation because this is a place of education and we can actually come up with the, with the knowledge because we, everybody's scholars in this room, you know what I'm saying? We can come up with the knowledge and, and trace the roots back and have the conversation and everyone leave the table with some understanding. You know what I'm saying? That's our thing. Peace. Great. Thanks, Truth. And yeah. uh, Catherine, you know how to ask a question. Um, and I'll just say, I think, you know, we do our students a disservice if we don't, um, if, if, if they don't push themselves beyond their own identities and inherited traditions. Their world is smaller and so is ours. Um, uh, I think Joan had a question, but Nick, if you had a direct response, I think you get to jump in front. And, okay, sure. Joan, then Nick. My question is so much less challenging. Uh, <laughs> so boring, I'm so sorry. Uh, my question is, uh, what do some of the uh, recent graduates who had majors in your area uh, get to do after graduation? I love that question. Forrest, I think you were going to jump in? Or if not, Louisa I, always has a Rolodex of, of outcomes. I know. And I, I, I actually got some too. I'm going to send you some. Um, uh, you know, just some students that they're, they're all doing lots of stuff. Um, one student, Ellie Burke, who, who is actually going to speak to my capstone students later on this quarter, she is working in video editing. She makes short films for many different organizations, MoMA. She's, she's living and working in New York. Um, <clears throat> she's edited films for Prada, you know, big kind of uh, design firms and stuff like that. If you check out her um, Vimeo, uh, which I linked in the chat, you can see some of her short films and, and also some of the work she did while here at Antioch, um, including a, a film I got to help out on, which was awesome. Um, uh, there's also Elaine Bell has a design company she started. Um, it's called All Trades Design Company. It's based in Columbus. Uh, she does like large scale murals, um, mostly for businesses, but she's done some for um, uh like she's done a ceiling within a within a um, really kind of cool new hip sort of diner she's also done um big large outdoor windows displays for for different places in columbus definitely you should check out her work and if you're looking for anything like that you should um you should hit her up all trades design that's also linked and then another one i just would throw out is selena loomis in graduate school right now finishing a, a master's um in fiber arts and kind of expanded media or expanded uh, sculptural field um, at uh, Ohio University. Um, you know, uh, their partner too, I'll just throw out, uh, just, uh, this was a few years ago, published a book of um, poetry, M. M. Lewis Amrein, um, uh called Evening Primroses. It's put out by Recenter Press, definitely worth checking out. Anyway, just a few. I know everybody has a lot of these, so we'll give others. Those are great, Forrest. Um, I'll throw out two more that are just coming up off the top of my head. Um, Heather Linger, who um, worked with Forrest a lot and um, worked with all of us in different respects. She um, did a co-op in Argentina as one of her last co-ops. And so I got to know Heather a lot when I was mentoring her in that co-op. And then after graduation, she joined, we've had a number of students who have joined a program It's called Auxiliares. It's in Spain. Um, the Spanish government has hired um, English speakers to teach English in their classrooms all around the country. And so Heather um, signed up for that program. I think at first she was placed in a school in Barcelona and then um, ended up switching cities. She ended up in Madrid. She stayed on, she did it for three years. And in her third year did a, a master's degree in graphic design in Madrid with a very international group of young designers and is now um, moved back to the state. She came back to live in New York as a graphic designer. Um, Cole Gentry, who was a performance uh, major, was also, I think, class of 2017, along with Heather, um, is now the creative marketing director of a, a company called Teammate. They're out in Los Angeles doing digital storytelling. Um, We've got a lot of wonderful, um, yeah, alumni just in this in this last more more recent cohorts that are doing great things. I don't know if Michael, if you want to add any more, but it's a great group. Yeah, a, a, a nice connection too with Heather uh, as a graphic designer. She did her last colloquia catalog, and before her, Hannah Priscilla Craig 
was our graphic designer for a number of years. So they've stayed connected to the college and have supported uh, the colloquia publication that we've done uh, in the past. Like, again, Selena going to uh, OU and doing that program. Um, and I, I talked to I talk to former students all the time about, oh, they decided now like um, Esme Westerlin wants to go to grad school. And she wants to both, she's been a caregiver to children and to the elderly and wants to incorporate that in her arts practice. Uh, so there's, you know, it's, it's great to be in communication with these students uh, and see what they're doing because they're doing so much. It's, it's just so amazing. And the, the creative practice might come back. Catherine, you might still become a real dancer yet. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm conscious of time in the stack, so I want to. Um, I just want to say that the, the information you've just given us is so inspiring. I wish I had it in writing. I wish I had it in a format that I could share with donors. You, you all might know that I'm on staff in the advancement office, and uh, I really like to brag on your behalf. And we should also mention uh, Mary Evans, who uh, a formerly incarcerated person who came to the college, graduated and is working with the college and working in media. She's part of a number of projects I've worked on. Uh, amazing, amazing person uh, doing so much. And really her coming to Antioch gave her that space to be able to develop after being returned um, from being incarcerated. So big shout out to Mary Evans. Absolutely. Mary's first co-op was with WISO and um, she started through that co-op her initial podcast of re-entry stories that's now syndicated through WISO. Um, it's a brilliant um, series and uh, I appreciate you. Yeah, Michael, Mary's a yeah. doing incredible work, incredible mm -hmm. work. And equipping others to tell their stories, also so important. Um, Nick and then Gail. Yeah, um, my question really is the bridge between what I think you all have been talking about having on campus and what John was asking about in terms of, you know, what happens in the afterlife. Uh, my, my, I'm very curious to know what co-op is working on that helps the students move between what you're doing there and, and what opportunities they might have afterward. So I don't know who would be asked. It's too bad Brooke isn't here. Okay. Well, Louisa is. Louisa is. <laughs> but uh, anyway, all right, I'll, I'll shut up and <laughs> no, I'll I'll respond quickly. I'll keep it short because of time. And I see that Gail has her hand raised too. But um, a lot of those students that we just mentioned, I can tell you some of the co-ops that they did that actually were direct stepping stones into their professional careers. Um, you know, Ellie Burke, um, you know, want, knew she wanted to be in New York, um, had a series of really fantastic co-ops and um, we made sure that had her, you know, final opportunity as a co-op in New York. We have a wonderful group, many of you may know, of um, New York City alumni who are artists and former artists and who have provided some amazing um, partnerships with co-op opportunities there. Um, Michael Caselli has also connected us to a lot of wonderful organizations in, in New York City. Um, but you see time and time again, um, you know, the Mary's... Um, co-ops with WYSO and in radio that really launched her career um, as a broadcaster and media artist. Um, so I would say um, we continue to see co-op as really a stepping stone and, um, and sometimes in surprising ways, as I was telling you, like Heather Linger's story of ending up teaching English in Spain, not necessarily focused on her art and then finding her way yet again, as I think you all know, Antiochians have that amazing adaptability that they learn through co-op that then just allows them to um, step stones um, beyond graduation as well. What I'm interested in though, is what the college is doing. It sounds like the alumni are doing oh. things and, what, and uh, students are very creative and fall into these opportunities. But I, I'm interested in the college uh, support system that moved beyond you guys. 
you know, what happens sure. organizationally to, to build this? Well, one thing that I can tell you is, um, so, uh, you know, we continue to be the connectors of those co-op partnerships and co-op opportunities for students. And then we work with them on what is their plan for after, after Antioch. Recently, um, you may know Eric Miller, who has been with the college for decades. Eric Miller has kind of rejoined our um, solar system in co-op to work primarily um, both with, with on-campus job opportunities, but also with our career kind of launch co-ops. And those are really helping our students to plan for their post-baccalaureate success. So what are they planning to do after graduation? And we have been working, we work together really closely as a team. And so part of what we're doing um, right now is actually, I've been writing lots of letters of recommendation to students who are applying to graduate programs. Um, and, and so Eric within his wheelhouse is also doing one-on-one -on -one interviews with students to prepare them around their their career goals. And I'd say generally students are getting a, a lot of support um, both with you know, where they want to apply, but also where they imagine themselves in, in the world. I'd like to add too uh, that the arts division has, you know, uh, Louisa comes to our, our division meetings. She's integral to our conversations about what we're doing as a, a program. And we feel it's really important that the co-op person who kind of represents uh, what we do is integrated into uh, our decision-making process. So I think I just wanted to put that out there because I think it's really important. Great, thanks. Um, conscious of time, so let's let Gail have the last question or well, comment, whichever yeah, you prefer. I have a comment. I was struck by uh, the faculty saying that they want the students to make art right away and that it's consequential. I'm a 75 graduate in communications and arts, and I'm currently having a retrospective. And I just spoke to a history of photography class, and I realized two of the pieces in that show are work that I did at Antioch. Um, and one, one is a self-portrait that I did. The, the show is called About Time, and it's all about time. I'm, I do photography. Um, and one is a self-portrait that is, I don't know why I took it, but it's a picture of me with older women in the background from a uh, Ms. magazine. And that's what my work is all about, is that how everything is in flux and changes. And the other was something I did my first, that was like in my first photo class. And the other was, I think I done my first semester at Antioch, um, two terrific faculty, Marge Nelson and Bob Devine, um, which was sexism in Saturday morning children's cartoons. And I have no idea where I had never worked in media. I never thought of myself as an artist at all. And I have no idea where the idea of doing a video came from. And in the 70s, that was, you know, very difficult to do. And Bob Devine, bless his heart, would come to campus and let me in on Saturday morning so I could record off of television, because that was the only way to do it back then. Um, it, it's amazing. And I was not in his class. I wasn't one of his students. I was, you know, it's amazing that he um, did that, but it did totally uh, change my life. And um, the show's at American University, and there's a book, uh, Mac Books, which is a UK publisher of photography books. Um, so, you know, you you never know what um, you're going to inspire in students. And when I spoke to this history of photography class, they were all like, wow, you know, it was something that I did in college. Obviously, most of the work is <laughs> more recent than that, but. Um... I'd love to just like throw something out there too as an alum. Uh, the faculty that I had when I was at the college, Karen Shirley, Alan Jones, John Ronsheim, Demi Reber, totally formed me and totally informed me as an artist. And I credit them with where I went in my career and me being back, me, me being back as a professor at Antioch after being a student at Antioch and appreciating that kind of contribution that you talk about with Bob, all of my faculty were like that. And I say, so I really wanna recognize that and acknowledge that and celebrate that kind of aspect of the Antioch education that I think connects us. The, the other thing was that, that 
from the moment I stepped on campus, and I'm, it's probably still that way, is you got the sense that you could do anything, that anything was possible. And that was so unbelievable and freeing. And when I went to graduate school at CalArts, it was a very competitive kind of environment. And I was totally unprepared for that. And I remember writing Bob Devine a letter about how much I appreciated, in retrospect, the supportive environment of Antioch and how, um, you know, how really unusual and different that was. And it's, um, I'm very thankful for that. Yeah, I, I actually taught at CalArts for five years in the theater department. Oh. So I'm aware, it was actually my graduate um, person was the head of the arts division there when I went there to teach. So it was really interesting to be like, no longer a student, but a colleague. Right. And start to engage in conversations. So yeah, but it was a very different place. I mean, I went to RISD for my graduate degree, uh, but it was a very different approach to kind of uh, art making that I'd come from, but I was able to get into RISD because of the experience I had at the college. Right. I wanna also yeah. just, we, I know we gave a shout out already to Julia Reichert, but I just wanna mention, um, Julia Reichert did a commencement speech um, a few years ago. We were in the pandemic and was able to um, really create a whole short film for the commencement speech. It was a retrospective on, on her life really. And what we share, we show it with our co-op um, classes, with our preparation for co-op classes for the incoming first years. And Julia, you know, it was her senior project at Antioch was her film Growing Up Female that ended up being her first, um, you know, professional film. It became her first distribution film and she formed her, um, you know, co-op, her cooperative of filmmakers to make a distribution company for that film. And we emphasize to students to this day, you know, that that was her senior project and you can, you can do this here too. Um, so I, I feel like we've, we've worked to try and continue some of those same legacies and that you all would recognize that still on campus. Uh, Karen for it had her hand up. I, um, this has been really great. I just wanted as a non-artist, although I was a dancer in high school and I made the decision that I was not gonna be a good professional dancer. So I wound up in biology, started in math, wound up in biology, all that. But the, the thing about Antioch and with the arts is, and all of the departments, is that you were welcome no matter whether you were a major in that area or just somebody who wanted to do something. So um, I, I did some dance. I danced with Kenneth King. I did a little bit of uh, theater in my last year. It was a uh, a play, I was a walk-on on a play that Assad directed. And I actually got a credit for it. It was amazing. <laughs> and, but my best story was one summer I got mono. Now the, that getting mono was not the, the important thing, but I had to drop organic chemistry because I couldn't stand up in the lab. So the next semester came around and I was supposed to take organic two, but I hadn't finished organic one. So I needed something else. And I told Ed Samuel, well, how about I take ceramics and I'll pick up organic chemistry at another time. And he said, sure. I never did take organic chemistry and I made some pretty lousy ceramics, but it was the opportunity. And I think that was something that really enriched the life of students to be able to I don't want to say dabble, but to immerse yourself in, in various disciplines, even if you had no intention of going into them uh, as a major. Yeah, just a, a really quick story. Uh, and this involves uh, Luis's grandfather, uh, Bob Beery. Uh, I was taking a paleontology class with him, and he allowed me to do paintings of the fossils and the rocks that I was looking at instead of taking the final test. Uh, just because he was like, this is equally as important. Uh, he was amazing, uh, amazing, amazing uh, professor. But these are, I love to hear these stories and these testimonies to Why the freeness of, of how porous the campus can be and how generative that can be that um, uh, you don't even fully acknowledge the, aren't aware of the value until 10, 20, 30 years later. Um, it's really great. Joan, last word. 
small story, and that is when I was teaching women's studies at Denison uh, in the 70s, uh, uh, Julia Reichert's uh, film, Growing Up Female, was the only thing available. And I didn't know she was an Antiochian, but I grabbed it and I used it in my teaching. I used it year after year in my teaching. And then I found out that she had done it as an undergraduate of Antioch. It's just amazing and a wonderful, a wonderful uh, affirmation for me and uh, as an alum. And I also uh, loved that she was doing professional work when she was still an undergraduate. And it was the only one available. So she was the pioneer. Yeah, there's a fearlessness that that is so generative. Mm -hmm. I want to thank the um, faculty for their time tonight, but also just the um, work that they're doing with the current generation of students to carry this along. And I want to thank each of the alums for joining us and getting a, just a thin sliver of some of what's going on on campus today. Um, hope you might uh, join and tell your, your colleagues to join the fifth of our five panels. The next one's on um, uh, social innovation, social enterprise, or as we secretly call it, money and power. Um, and uh, you'll get another slice of what's going on on campus. And thanks also to Tristan for uh, uh, organizing these panels for us. Yeah, I'd love to Everybody. love to just uh, read a quote that uh, is really uh, inspirational to me about making work and what the work of art is. It says, a work of art is no more than an idea expressed through an object, and this object might be dispensable, renewable, or even known by report. It's one of the best definitions of art I've found so far. And there's always a question of what is art? So it, it, it was really inspirational to me to, to find this quote. Thanks, Michael. That's a good, good, uh nugget to end on. Um, thanks, everybody. Enjoy your evenings and see you again very soon. Thank you, everybody. It's been great. Bye.